from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. I'm Anne McLean from the Library's Concert Office. My colleague David Pilar and I have the great pleasure of talking with Christian Bezadenhout tonight. Welcome back to the library. Thank you. It's exciting for us to have you here again. Um, the program we had him here, fortunately, the last time maybe one or two of you heard it, was with the Collegium Vocal Ghent, an all Haydn evening. And I think you created that, right? You put it together with part songs. Y yes, and it was a kind of dramaturgical program that was um, the kind of narrative of part songs, solo keyboard sonatas, and uh, solo songs. Um, mixed in, originally mixed in with readings as well, um, but we didn't do the readings, I guess, in the concert version here. Um, it was a, a wonderful program. Uh, it ended up being a wonderful program. It, it was. I was listening to just, we have a recording, I was just checking it out the other day. Very special. And tonight you'll be performing both Haydn and Beethoven. So everyone uh, on our staff has been watching over the years since that time, the raves that Christian has been receiving as a master of three instruments, harpsichord, forte piano, and piano. The London Times calls you the most brilliant of today's forte pianists with a claim for a consummate command of the possibilities of the instrument, really. Um, and critics comment that he creates magic. So we're looking forward now to chatting with you about some of your magical skills, <laughs> your press to di di digitization, and learning uh, a little bit about the works we'll hear and also about the instrument we'll hear tonight. So I thought maybe, since probably several of us have some of your Mozart recordings, um, maybe we'd start by talking to you about this multi-multi-volume set that you've made and your obsession with Mozart. Um, people often ask me where this comes from, and. Um, over the course of many interviews, I've, I've had to just really admit, quite honestly, that for me, the, the big watershed moment was Amadeus, the film, actually. Um, I, I must have seen it when I was about eight or nine, I guess. Nine, probably. Because um, I remember very distinctly the, the, some of the scenes by my parents shielded me from the first scene when Salieri tries to kill himself. Um, but I, I still think that it's, it's the greatest film made about a composer, um, regardless of any of the historical quibbles one might have. Um, I think it's, it's arguably the greatest film about a composer because Peter Schaffer was absolutely insistent on the fact that the, the one of the central characters in the film would be Mozart's music, in fact. And I think unlike any other film about a composer, the role that music plays in that film is, 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 is portrayed with such honor and, and reverence, in a sense. And also the, the, the taste that went into choosing the best moments, musically speaking, in that film. I look back now and, and see the film and I realize that's what really struck me about it. And just this, the, the music somehow spoke to me so deeply, very subconsciously, unconsciously. Uh, yeah, I, and I realized at the time that my parents had played a huge amount of music in the house when I was two, three, four, five, really at an age when I wasn't able to say, oh, that's the Mozart big G minor symphony, or that's Figaro or Cosi. But hearing this music in the film, you realize that your, your childhood memories ingrained in you then come to the surface. It, it was a very, a very strong moment of, of um, connection on that level. And after that, I just was completely obsessed. I wouldn't listen to anything but Mozart. Um, my parents loved Bach and Beethoven as well, but I was very single-minded. Um, <laughs> And around that time, Phillips brought out the complete Mozart edition uh, in, t in time for the 91 celebrations. And that was, I mean, that was the only thing I cared about in my whole life, was having that set. And of course, my parents realized that it was just ridiculously expensive. Um, but it, the, the man and the music and the myths surrounding him and the fact that it was the, the celebration year and uh, I also discovered quite a lot of recordings of his music at that time that changed my life forever as well. And it was a sort of perfect storm of timing and, and situation. Your first recording was actually an all Mozart disc outside of the Harmonia Mundi, right? That's right, yeah. David. Not many people know about that <laughs> album. Uh, it was a, a volume of, of all Mozart uh, keyboard works and specifically all Mozart in minor keys. Um, 
I wanted to, it, the disc is called Storm und Drang, and I was 20 years old and it just had a mad idea about how this thing would go. I recorded the disc in one day, which I don't know how, I, I really don't know how I did that. I, I would die now, I think, if I had to do that. <laughs> But the idea was it had a red cover, every piece was in a minor key. I was trying to portray a Mozart who was inspired by the Sturm und Drang movement of the middle of the 18th century. Even if you don't think that that's a real musical movement, it's very clear that something is in the water around that time that inspires people like Haydn, and later, I think, Mozart emulating Haydn to write music of uncommon um, stress and violence and rhetorical extremity. And, you know, it can't be any coincidence that they're all doing this somewhat at the same time. They're choosing pieces in, uh, writing pieces in keys like G minor consistently, and this very angular, um, somewhat tempestuous music comes out of these guys and, and is later, I think Mozart then later replicates this style in, in honor of that. But I wanted to show a, a side of Mozart's character that was the furthest thing away from this kind of genteel elevated music um, that, that his music can turn into, particularly his keyboard music, if not treated with the right kind of combination of intensity and unlocking maybe, let's say, hidden layers of meaning or detail that are not necessarily conveyed by the specificity of the notation. I'd put it that way. But yes, that's right. That was the very first album, David. And so you develop and you're con not conveyed by the specificity. That's interesting. So um, are you thinking of just each player, what he brings what, to the instrument itself each time, or uh, conventions of no ornamentation or treatises? Or? It's, and I think it, at the end of the day, It's much more a question of understanding that the exasperating fact about playing any music, uh, particularly music from the 18th century, is that my, my feeling is that the, the difference between the blueprint that you're given as the text, uh, black and white dots on a page which convey rhythm and pitch and all this stuff, the difference between that and the end result is, I would argue, some of this, uh, a larger gap than possibly, um, well, that is, this is probably very contentious what I'm going to say, but I think, I, I believe in the case of Mozart, that gap, gap is possibly the largest of, of any composer I play, in the sense that Mozart's music is the least, well, here are some examples. When you play Bach, for example, there's a huge amount of abstraction that happens in the process of interpretation, which is not necessarily conveyed in the notation, but the notation doesn't need to have it there. With Mozart, the trouble is, if you treat his music like that, it sounds very boring. Mm -hmm. um, Bach can be played on a Moog synthesizer, and there's a kind of incredible delight and magic that happens as a result of that. But yeah, we recognize the dance the dance references in his music, the incredible symmetry, the incredibly refined counterpoint. Mozart sounds absolutely unlistenable on MIDI. Um, and I think composers who do uh, require a lot more care and effort and charm and love and attention. I think the 18th century idea of what it means to play a piece means to graft your personality onto it. I mean, this is why people like Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven via so dramatically from, from their forefathers Haydn, uh, from Handel and Bach. And that is that the act of composition and performance and reading the text becomes a kind of triangle, a trinity of, of act, text and act and performance. And none of that is really in the notation. I mean, you know what articulations to play and sometimes what dynamics to play, but really to get to the heart of the conveying the rhetorical message of the music is what 18th century music, late 18th century music is all about, I think. Yeah. If I can follow up on that just a little bit. Yes. Um, one thing that Anne had mentioned is that you're used to playing on multiple keyboard instruments. Yes. And if you um, trace, say, across the lifespan of Haydn, mm where he's writing for specifically different types of instruments over time, his level of specificity in his notation does increase, I think. Yes. Um, is, how does that kind of inter interface with what you're just that's, that's such a good question, David, because I, I think what you see, well, what David says is so true. Haydn has a career, possibly the largest span of any keyboard um, 
career in a sense. Um, Haydn is writing clearly for the clavichord in certain repertoire. Absolutely, he knows the harpsichord. He is um, also uh, greatly enamored of this uh, piano. He writes specifically the chances instruments were his absolute favorite of the kind of South German Viennese style five octave instrument that Mozart and Haydn knew at this time and also Schubert in the early part of his career. Then, of course, Haydn goes to London and plays the newfangled instruments in that city, which are dramatically different from the Viennese instruments he knew. I think what happens with Haydn, for example, you see in the London sonatas of the, of the early 19th century of Haydn, that he starts, I think, writing dynamics and articulations that possibly indicate in his mind what a Viennese player must think of and do when they're playing these pieces on a London piano. So he writes lots of wedges and very interesting kind of quite um, kooky instructions in a sense. Incredibly weird and strangely specific dynamic markings that you very rarely see in other, in other Haydn pieces. Um, then at times when you go back, uh, let's say 30 years and look at works that, that might have been conceived of and or performed at the clavichord, Haydn is strangely lazy about details of articulation in a way that Mozart is never. I mean, to the end of his days, Mozart will <coughs> lavish attention in matters of, of articulation and become incredibly lazy with dynamics. And you see these different priorities surfacing at different times for, for both of these guys. Um, I'd never thought of it quite like that, that, that it it does really document Haydn's current obsession with that, the said keyboard instrument that's in front of him, perhaps. Do, do you think it has anything to do with their playing styles, or just performance styles? Very much so. Um, I still don't know uh, exactly how to put that into words. I think someone like Tom Began uh, would be able to explain that really eloquently. Um, but I think those, those connections, the way the notation is reflected, the, the way the notation reflects a composer's relation to his keyboard instrument at that time, this is one of those sort of secrets, holy grail elements of performance practice that's yet to really be, really brilliantly ex um, shown. Because it's such a personal covenant between player and instrument, um, especially now in, in this configuration where we are playing in 2016 and 17, on old instruments and trying to recreate what we know about the style, and yet it's a very, very, very postmodern thing that we're doing now, playing these old instruments in modern times, and that it's become so trendy to hear performances of music of the 18th century played on period instruments in modern times. It's all just, it's kind of messy in a sense. Well, let's for a follow up further on the Haydn. Um, this is an unusual piece that you're doing, the variations. And how did you put this program together? And how does it relate to the Beethoven? And also, David has some comments on the octave writing at, in the Haydn, which is very unusual. So, absolutely. Um, look, this is a this is a clear anomaly for Haydn. This set of variations. It's um, it's strange on so many levels. Um, Structurally, it's odd because Haydn has this very melancholy, wistful theme presented in F minor, um, and then a new theme, uh, a binary theme, which he presents immediately after it in F major. Um, and I think this is one of those cases, times when you really realize that people like Mozart and Schubert were so deeply uh, impressed by Haydn's ability to go back and forth between the minor mode and the major mode without any preparation and it becomes a real trope at this time in the late 18th century. Um, that aside, Haydn chooses the key of F minor for this piece, which is a hugely unusual choice for him. I mean, we know he writes symphonies in F minor. F minor is described differently by different theorists at the time, but the, the, the basic I think the basic thing that you get from F minor from almost everyone is a sense of loneliness and despair, a kind of melancholy tragedy. It's not the realm of C minor or G minor, which for Haydn, I think, and also for people like Mozart, have a much more brutal kind of fate knocking on the door characteristic. This is music of unbelievable introversion and introspection. Curiously then, you go along with this set of variations, which is um, very intimate and kind of timid and, and yearning and sorrowful. And then Haydn does something that you, you'll see later in Schubert, for example, in the, in the, the A major sonata 959, where you have this ostensibly very quiet 
sad, intimate structure or, or mode or rhetorical style established, and then he just goes mad. The music kind of stops, as it were, and, and descends into complete fantasy, fantasy madness. It goes into strange key areas, it goes into D flat major, which is the relative, uh, it is the relative major of G flat major. It's, um, it's uh, sorry, the, the, the dominant of G flat major, and then all of a sudden you have this outburst of kind of tragedy and virtuosity, which then dies down again, and then we return to the bare bones structure of the original, uh, albeit slightly altered. It, it's a very, it's kind of like a scenic cantata, this piece. It reminds me a lot of Ariana and Naxos, actually, in the sense that it's charting kind of mental breakdown, but then returns to some order of semblance, and it can't be any accident that Ariana and Naxos starts in E flat major, has an aria in B flat major, an aria in F major, but the end of the piece is in F minor, and documents Ariana who's stuck on Naxos and spends 20 minutes just complaining about the fact that her lover rejects her and leaves her there. That it ends in F minor in this kind of world of madness and feminine um, scorn and fury. Um, and I think F minor is a very deliberate choice for Haydn in that sense in this piece. What I wanted to do as well was get these guys together in a way, Beethoven and Haydn, because Haydn goes to Vienna and studies with Beethoven, sorry, other way around. <laughs> Beethoven goes to Vienna and studies with Haydn for a while, but it's not a great relationship. And it's very clear that Haydn knows instantly that, that this is an enormous talent, but he, I think he feels very slighted about the fact that Beethoven never really publicly acknowledges that he is Haydn's student. He dedicates music to him, but there isn't this sense of let me present a public concert in your honor or let me really publicly acknowledge you as my mentor and teacher. And I think in that sense, when Beethoven studies with Albrechtsberger, he realizes that he's got someone he can control a lot more. Um, and Haydn doesn't really do that for Beethoven. I think it's very clear that they have a kind of jealousy towards each other because they both know that they do the so same thing so well, in a sense, and that is that they have this uncanny ability to take sometimes the most banal, kind of ridiculously crude material and, and spin these motives out in such ingenious ways, um, often at the expense of sophisticated material to begin with. I mean, I think sometimes Heid, both Haydn and Beethoven, if you really talk to them and say, if you took to, the, to this, this kind of material, let's say this motive to your composition teacher and said, look, I've got this fabulous figure. It's going to be the source of, of inspiration for the following 20, you know, five to 10 minute movement. They would all say, well, that's madness. This is not going to work. On the other hand, someone like Mozart goes to his composition teacher and presents them with five themes and they're all just excruciatingly beautiful. And the problem becomes, well, maybe choose two of them, but not five, you know. And Mozart says, well, no, I'll write a rondo and I'll have five themes that are just of this incredible characteristic beauty and brilliance. I think for both Haydn and Beethoven, the idea of writing a melody that can just sit by itself and be completely at home with itself, rhythmically and melodically, is something that exasperates them a little bit and also really fine counterpoint. As opposed to your talking about Mozart, what he was able to do. That exactly. Thing. That's my theory. I mean, there's this amazing, um, 496 is a trio, a piano trio of Mozart, and he writes a variation movement, and I think the, the second last variation is, um, is a contrapuntal variation with invertible counterpoint in it, and Beethoven copies this variation out many times with great exasperation, you can tell, because he's sort of saying like, ye gods, how is it possible that someone like Mozart can absorb the style of Handel and Bach after having get, getting to know it sort of in about 1782, and immediately, absorb this deeply, deeply sophisticated contrapuntal possibility into his own writing. I mean, he does struggle with it a little bit in the Haydn quartets. Interesting somehow, that's sort of ironic, I think. But, but Haydn and Beethoven don't, they, they are jealous of different things. They're jealous of the things that they don't have. And Beethoven is, is jealous of what he sees in Mozart, which is this effortless lyrical grace and counterpoint. Um, and I think, this is my theory, and I, I think people will argue with me a lot, but I think Mozart is the 
is hands down the master orchestrator of his time. Um, I think he gets a lot of great ideas from Haydn, and Beethoven does as well. But I think the palette of, of 19th century orchestral sound that we have that really became the standard sound is, is almost all set up by paradigms that Mozart establishes basically from scratch, actually. Hmm. This idea of what the wind band can sound like, what, absolutely. I, I mean, Mozart comes up with these ideas seemingly from nowhere. I mean, he starts writing for the clarinet in this, in this way that is now completely idiomatic to us, but he's really, it really comes out of nowhere. He decides to write for very specific instrumental combinations like flute and clarinets without oboes in the mature piano concertos. Um, uh, questions of balance and timbre between flute and bassoon, for example, or, and then vis-a-vis -vis the clarinet and oboe groups, um, the way those groups interact with the string sound, this, this level of sophistication is something that you see in every single genre that Mozart writes in, in the sense that the, the orchestration possibilities of every one of those genres is unsurpassed and seemingly without previous models, hmm. with a, the possibility of a string quartet and the symphony, obviously, but f from Haydn, I'm rambling here a little bit. You should stop me, David. Well, no, well, <laughs> I, I want to come back to something later about, just more about the program at large, but, but speaking of your, orc the use of the word orchestration and the Haydn in particular, um, I, I know that you speak eloquently about um, the, the the way that one can approach the, the forte piano. But I just want to bring up one little technical aspect that I think is an example of Haydn orchestrating for his instrument uh, in this case, and that's the crossed hands. Um, and, and that type of, uh, we'll see that in several pieces yeah. tonight. Um, it strikes me though as, as, you know, I'm used to hearing more, more of this on a modern piano yes. uh, personally. So it, but it strikes me as being much more of a significant gesture in that world. And, and maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, the, the, yeah, the hand crossing thing is a, is a big thing. Um, let, put it this way, in, in music for, in, in music like sonatas, which is designed to be played in small settings, um, i.e. not in public, you see that composers like Mozart and Haydn tend to be quite conservative in the technical demands they play on, place on players, mostly because these sonatas are not, they don't imagine these uh, sonatas as works for the, the future, in a sense. This is music that's designed to be eaten up, devoured by amateurs. Very good players, technically. But Mozart doesn't write a keyboard sonata with the idea of, of playing it in public. But the one thing that he does always play in public is sets of variations. I'm just trying to highlight the difference between public and private in the 18th century, which was an incredibly strict divide. Keyboard sonatas were not played in public. The fact that Mozart played a violin sonata with Regina Strunasacci at a public concert in the 1780s is incredibly unusual. The fact that he plays the quintet for piano and winds at a public concert to which people buy tickets is super strange. But at every one of these public concerts, Mozart, for example, who we know, especially in his blockbuster period from sort of 1780, let's say three to six, always played a piece of pure improvisation in a concert, whether a fantasy, uh, which is a, a piece that has various themes and sections strung together, or a set of variations on a well-known tune, or an original melody by Mozart. And he would really do these on the spot, in situ, live, in front of an audience. And then we're lucky enough that he wrote them down. But hand crossing, you only see in Mozart variation sets and in Mozart piano concertos, because these are pieces that are designed for himself to play. So they necessarily contain the most virtuosic music that you'll see in his career. And I can tell you that the technical demands versus comp from the variation sets to compared to the sonatas are enormously different. And hand crossing, there's a visual rhetoric involved in this as well, which is what David is bringing up, which I think is wonderful, is that you actually see the hands crossing over which is something that 18th century, 18th century audiences, I think, would have found absolutely outrageously crazy to look at. So you've got the visual element, but the other thing is, if you listen to a program like this, bear in mind that the five octave forte piano of the 1780s or 70s has very different sound characteristics in each register because the, the striking point is different in every part of the piano. So the place where the hammer hits the string is very different in the bass compared to the tenor, compared to the upper treble. So you've got this kind of 
geography and topography then established by visually seeing the fact that the hands are playing in different places. So you can actually see that they're doing that, um, which I think really underlines or underscores the fact that the sound of those registers is so different. So the left hand will be doing its thing in the tenor, and the right hand will go to the extreme bass and then extreme treble. And I think that's a real kind of masterclass or expose in, in how different those areas of the piano sound. So you can hear it and see it at the same time. I mean, the, the idea of Haydn to do that is so, it's such a mind bender because it's a, a variation set, which is ostensibly a public genre for technical display, but it's in F minor and it's andante. And yet there are these tools of virtuoso showmanship that are incorporated into it. Um, the, the, the really fascinating example of that. Would he have played that ever himself? I think probably. Um, I don't really know. I, and I'm very, I, I'll admit that I don't have a very strong sense of Haydn, the person performer, when I'm playing his music. Um, I because I. You don't read much about it. N no, I, it's very hard to know ex exactly um, what, which of these pieces he was playing, which of them he sort of designed for himself to play privately, mm -hmm. pieces like the London Sonatas that were clearly not meant for his, his performance. Um, Haydn is one of those guys who is not really fettered by the realities of playing, a little bit like Beethoven in the sense, where Mozart is deeply, deeply concerned with what's possible on instruments. Um, Haydn doesn't really care, and so as a result creates these kind of fantasy realms of possibility, which mm -hmm. again is, I think, why Beethoven is obviously so attracted to Haydn's music and the kind of deliberate way in, it, in which it just says, you know what, your technical concerns are of no interest to me. Um, the, your, we will make your instru instrument do what I want it to do. And you see this in Beethoven too, in, on every instrument in every genre. In the symphonies, if you talk to period instrument players who play those symphonies regularly on period instruments, there is not a night that they play a concert of Beethoven symphonies that goes by that they don't end and say, it's an enormous struggle to play this music. It. Yeah. It's not just that it's physically tiring, there's this sense that Beethoven asks you to do things that require kind of superhuman concentration and physical coordination. And if you, if you hit it, you hit it like right out of the park. But if you don't, it can end in tragedy and disaster. <laughs> And Mozart never, ever does that. I have never once played a Mozart piano concerto or a sonata or a set of variations where I have the feeling that he's kind of taunting you. And both Haydn and Beethoven do that a lot. Um, not, possibly not deliberately at the same time, but they, they both do it. Can I go back to something you were saying uh, just a little bit earlier about, uh, you didn't say exactly this, but basically uh, motivic parsing versus, uh, say, spun melodies. <laughs> um, and the pieces that we have tonight, there's, uh, we have a lot of uh, rondos and, uh, and um, literally rondos, but also um, the t different types of development that I think that, that are interesting and, and what I think that they, uh, I don't know that this is worth talking about differences or if this is even important, but the notion of ornamentation as a form of variation versus other types of developmental variation that you might see you know, in, the, in a sonata. And of course, we do have two sonatas that we will be, mm -hmm. well, th three, I guess. Haydn also called his sonata. That's but, right. Um, just, just in general, or should we just, is that better? OK, so we just need to talk more into them. Is, is that right? Um, this speaks, uh, it's a, very, it's a very deep and um, serious question. Um, this speaks to a little bit to what I was saying earlier, this idea of trying to reframe in, in one's mind what people are doing when they're playing publicly in the late 18th century. F for the reason that we know that there are tons of really gifted professional pianists at this time. I mean, Mozart has lots of students, like Barbara Ploya, for example, and these are very good players. They can play anything perfectly. Um, what sets them apart from people like Mozart, particularly, and Beethoven, uh, 10 years later, is that Mozart and Beethoven are famous because they're gifted improvisers. So they grow up with contrapuntal training. They can write fugues, they can play continuo, they can improvise fantasies, variation sets, and that's what they're being tested on when they play in public. 
not if they can play perfectly. And I think that's, that's the first thing. You have to understand that that is the only reason, the reason that Beethoven becomes the celebrity pianist of his generation, um, and the reason that Mozart becomes the celebrity pianist of his generation. Um, there are others, of course. There are people like Clementi, who is also a similarly gifted improviser, but when it comes down to it, those names really emerge for very strong reasons. So, you have to understand that when Beethoven, let's say when Beethoven is playing a piano concerto in public, this is the first time the Viennese public has heard this piece. And we also know that what he's playing from, the physical product in front of him, is a kind of chicken scratch thing. It's a few pages with very, very rudimentary sketches of what's going on. And crucially, we know that I think Beethoven in his brain knows what's going on thematically clearly, but the actual details of the figuration in the moment of performance are left to that moment. If you look at a piece like the Third Piano Concerto, the way the pieces come down to us in the source material, it's a complete and utter mess. The same thing with the B-flat Concerto. There are wrong notes. The passage work veers off in strange directions that haven't been corrected. And I think the trouble is we're, we're hamstrung now by a tradition of urtext perfection, of trying to get the source in the best possible state possible. And I think in certain repertoires, that's kind of impossible, one of them being the piano concerto. It's very clear, if you look at Mozart piano concertos, that the level of specificity that he uses in writing a piece that he prepares for publication versus one that doesn't get published is a, is a difference of maybe 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. And it's my contention that when you look at a piece, a uh, late piano concerto of Mozart that he doesn't publish, the level of information that he conveys in the notation is by, by its nature, almost half as detailed as anything that I think was going on in one of those concerts. That doesn't just mean that he's improvising the cadenza, but the level to which he's improvising ornamentation on the spot, the level to which he's changing figuration from night to night, was I think a great, great deal greater than what we're used to, even by period instrument performers who are really well versed in the style. So the thing is you have three things happening. You have this piece of paper in front of you, which they're literally playing from, Mozart and Beethoven are not playing piano concertos by memory. They, I think they have some kind of text that they're looking at, interpreting, and reading, in a sense. It's not a very detailed text, but it's providing them information. You have the text, you have the composer reading and playing the text, and then you have the act of actually bringing that over to the audience. And I think what David is saying, which is fantastic, is that ornamentation is not seen as a kind of optional extra, it's a sort of emotional element in, in, the, in the rhetoric of performing, in the sense that when the emotion of the music becomes too strong, you're forced to ornament and decorate. And that's why you see in a Mozart piano sonata, when he prepares it, prepares it for publication, and he's got lots of time on his hands, he'll write out the ornaments, because he cares so much about the quality of that ornamentation being conveyed to the amateur out there who doesn't know how to do it. So ornamentation becomes a kind of structural element in the, in the actual emotional content of the music and not a kind of like glitter that you throw on stuff to, to make it more beautiful. So as a result, it really speaks to how different these guys are in their, in their thinking. I mean, I think Mozart is to, to his dying day, a melodist in the sense that he's thinking, he's thinking of melodies bring, presented and then altering those themes or presenting other themes or making themes go in curious directions. Whereas Beethoven and Haydn uh, really uh, are masters of this idea of just taking the tiniest building block, sometimes when, as I said earlier, when it's, when it's presented to you, uh, kind of grotesquely simple, but what becomes so fascinating is, is how, and especially you, you see this in Mozart a lot, you'll have these incredibly tiny development sections. And then in Haydn and Beethoven, the development becomes this place where they can really show their genius, in a sense. But Mozart sometimes suffers from this problem where he's, he says to himself, well, my themes are so fabulous, what should I do here in the development? Okay, I'll just for three lines uh, go through various chord progressions. I'll just take, curiously, what Mozart does sometimes, which is very strange, uh, is he'll just take one kind of virtuoso figure that he's presented in the exposition, and he'll just circle it through the circle of fifths or through some other kind of interesting harmonic sequence that he finds fascinating. And it'll be very quick. But then you see with Beethoven that he'll take this 
this very um, banal theme and spend a long time subjecting it to a very intense development. Um, and I don't know to what extent that was present in the improvisations, because you see that when Beethoven is writing out improvised music, like his cadenzas, they're sort of kind of five-minute fantasies. They're, they're, not, um, they're not that kind of um, incredibly detailed uh, motivic departures or explorations. They're, they're kind of freewheeling virtuoso-style fantasies um, that present different sections, much like a Mozart fantasy or a CPE Bach fantasy. But I'm not getting around to the question. Um, what was it, David? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is more, um, well, also, you're, you're, you're hitting at it from all sides, which is uh, ornamentation um, as, a, as a form of uh, very, I don't know, maybe it's a, where the intersection between or ornamentation and uh, recognition uh, that Rondo has a built-in uh, kind of formal grounding point, mm -hmm. um, yet, there's, yet there's ways in which it's varied often with mm -hmm. each occurrence. Mm -hmm. And then there's other ways in which it's developed and what might, what might you know, it's not a look at it as a development, but also just um, there's this developmental process that seems to be going on in each of these works. Um, and I've, I've, it seemed like ornamentation is also um, built into it. I mean, of course, it, it's built into it even more carefully in the, you know, in, in the, like in the pathetique with the... Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, they, they do... Everything happens sort of at the same time, but sort of differently. You, you see that for Beethoven, for, look, put it this way. For example, the Beethoven rondos that begin this program are possibly the most perfect themes that he writes in, in the span of his career. You, you see this very curiously when Beethoven is writing rondos. It's the same thing with the two romances for violin and orchestra. They are possibly the most exquisite melodies of their kind from Beethoven's career. And I think it's very true that he's trying to replicate a sort of Apollonian, Mozartian melody style in those pieces. And I'm sure if you really sat down with, with Blindfold and put on something like the F major violin romance, you would not be um, at fault if you said, gosh, that sounds like a theme that Mozart would write. And it's true of both of these rondos as well. They're, they have an unbelievably refined late 18th century grace to them. So then you see that Beethoven is at great pains to write ornaments that are in incredibly sophisticated, and I think Mozartian in their level of melodic, kind of um, horizontal beauty, in a sense. Someone like Haydn is interesting because the ornaments tend to be very, um, like Kabuki-esque, if I could put it like that. They have tiny, tiny import. They're trills and then uh, kind of very tiny triplet materials, um, uh, hand crossing with uh, sort of um, little mini trills, um, gruppetti of five notes in, in the right hand. They're not very melodic, in a sense. And they also get reinterpreted uh, so that, say, those groups of four or five notes are then, instead of being part of a turn or something like that, they become part of a run. Yes. And so they have a, a certain resonance that goes beyond. That's true. They become, they become kind of structural harbingers of, of some kind of thing. And then, and then that's why I think Haydn says, well, I've been going through this variation structure and I've been introducing these discrete, quite polite ornaments. Um, I mean, every variation set in the 18th century goes on the basic premise that you present a variation and you sort of exploit one thing. It's like, okay, here's the trill variation. Now here's the variation with syncopations. Now here's the variation with hand crossing. Now here's the variation with whatever. Um, and then Haydn says, okay, I've presented all of these ideas discreetly, and now I'm going to m merge or take myself into this world of fantasy, where all of this stuff is presented and then taken one step further. And he then introduces new textures that you, that you simply haven't seen anywhere in the work. Um, Mozart doesn't really do th that's actually not true. Mozart does two things. He'll do variation sets where he does like correct, 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 variation after variation, and then you just get the theme at the end. And then sometimes he'll do, uh, now that I'm thinking of it, he, he does this thing where he, where he has this sort of coda variation, which is much longer and very virtuosic, and, and often a capriccio as well, where he'll stop writing in bar lines and it'll become a written out fantasy. Probably that was, 
who knows, Haydn, Haydn was an enormous fan of Mozart. This is very clear. I mean, the respect between these guys is something that between two people is, is really deeply touching. Um, so Haydn was probably at some of these concerts in, in Vienna and could have heard Mozart's improvisatory abilities and was obviously deeply impressed by that. Uh, but it's, it's true that in ornamentation has this extra role, added significance at this time. Um, it's not just something that you read about in the sources as a, a sort of optional extra. It's something that the great masters had to really do in order to show their incredible understanding of the structure as well. This is fascinating. You know, it's, it's at a level that you don't usually get into, these kinds of comments. And it relates to this rhetorical fantasy finale. That's what David described it as in the Haydn piece, okay. which... Oh, sorry. Um, well, to leave that for a moment, but to talk about the instrument, maybe it's a good time to spend a little time talking about how an instrument like we'll hear tonight allows you to bring these to life in your own way as a virtuoso. Um, but, you know, specifically, this piano is a copy of a Chance piano from around 1800, um, and it very much is appropriate for this repertoire. And if you could talk a little bit about this one, and also a comment I read that you said um, you're able, that if one is relaxed, one can manage to bring out an extraordinary degree of lyricism in these forte pianos, which that fascinated me. These pianos, yeah, look, th th these pianos live or die on, on the tiniest, tiniest control of what's going on at the, at the key. Let me just explain that because the fact is all of these Viennese style instruments at this time have a, have a hammer that is literally attached to the key. And so the activity of the hammer is always, always being controlled by exactly what's happening at the base of the key. Now that's very, very different from the leverage system that was adopted in English and French pianos at the beginning of the 19th century where the increased weight and tension of the instrument meant that they needed to find a leverage system in order to cope with that. So the hammer is operated then by an intermediary system between the what's going on at the key and what's directly being transferred to the hammer. On a Viennese piano of this time, or a chance or anything, you can take the hammer out and the, the, the key out, and the hammer is on it. And everything that you do at the key is transferred without any delay or any lack of focus or clarity to the hammer. And I think that's what why these people like Haydn and Mozart and also Beethoven were so obsessed with the immediacy of Viennese instruments is that there's just no, there's no middleman. Everything that you do is clear. But it means you've also got a key dip that is remarkably shallower than the modern piano, and it takes much less physical pressure to lower these keys. But if you play with the sound at the bottom of the key with richness and focus, not like banging, but just a very intense and focused, like um, bony finger, um, it can produce a very warm and rich and focused sound, but it's a little bit like playing Schroeder's piano from Peanuts at first. It feels like you're playing a computer keyboard. Um, it, it's a little bit like the harpsichord as well when you're nervous. It just feels very surfacey and skatey, but when you can relax, um, you find that the sound, that you can draw the sound out from the instrument rather than imposing your shoulder or a kind of late 19th century physique on the instrument to, to, to sort of make the sound. Um, the other thing is there's a kind of built-in transparency to this sound where there's a marked decay that's present in each note, which produces this sense of space around the sound, which allows you to play faster tempos, but not just that, it makes the whole palette of articulation much more dental and speech-like and rhetorical and and hmm. incised in a way versus this very cantabile ideal that we've become used to with the projection and density of the modern piano sound. I think. You said something about you like the way these pianos speak rather than sing. I love that phrase. Thank you. Well, it's, they do. It's a, a highly... You know, it's really no accident that people like Mozart especially are obsessed with small-scale articulation at this period. Um, you see Mozart fussing endlessly about how long slurs are, uh, where dots go, wedges and all this stuff. Um, Haydn to a lesser extent, not because he does not, is not interested in it, but I think he's a bit lazier about writing it down. Um, 
Beethoven is similarly obsessed, but you start to see that the length of slurs becomes ever longer. Um, but these guys have a, a, a set of equipment that lets them do really small scale articulations really well. So their articulation style, the house style, is by, by its nature, therefore, very short slurs, groups of two to three, four, five notes. Um, none of the kind of phrasing slurs that you see in Schumann or Chopin later. And these pianos do that really well, I think. Well, maybe one question or one comment about the pathetique chords, and then I know that you need a break to get ready, but um, this piano seems ideally, ideally suited in a way to those opening chords of the adagio movement. Can you perhaps say a little bit about why that might be? Beethoven writes uh, seven, a seven note chord um, in, in the pathetique, the first chord of this piece. And it, it crucially, very unusually for the period, contains both a third and a fifth in the left hand, in addition to the octave. So you've got a four note chord played forte in the, in the bass. Now, the, any, anyone who's played a piano of any kind realizes that you do not write chords of four notes with a third and a fifth in, the, in that part of the instrument. It sounds like murky swamp water, basically. Um, so you see, you see people writing fifths, um, sometimes, sometimes isolated thirds like that, normally just octaves. Mozart very, very rarely writes chords like that. And if he does, he normally puts a line through them or notates them in his weird way that shows that he wants them to be played arpeggiated. Now, it could be that that's also what Mozart, uh, Beethoven had in mind with a chord like this. Um, we, we know that Beethoven is very lazy about something like that, and from his student Czerny, it's clear that he expected certain chords always to be arpeggiated. And it's becoming clear that one of the cases in which that's always true is chords like this with thirds and fifths, and that it becomes a kind of emblem of the fantasy. But on this piano, unlike the Steinway, where I have to be really careful about voicing a chord like that, not too loud, Otherwise, it sounds like amateur pianism. Here, I can just literally wallop that chord with all the force that I want and wait for it to decay because there's a strong decay in the sound. And then you can move on. And I think that's part of the characteristic of this piece. It, it's just trying to upend what happens in a keyboard sonata. You're starting this C minor sonata with a French-inspired overture, kind of tragic and depressing in C minor with this hideously inappropriate chord. Um, this is Beethoven, the kind of grotesque, defiant one. Um, and I think it, it's a gesture of, 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 of disorder and delight and disorder and dissent and revolutionary quality. And on this piano, it really sounds like this piano is about to break. It can't take the, the import and the intensity of what I'm about to write for it. And that sense of, of these instruments being required to, to life or death-like, live or die on what they're asked to do is such an important aspect of the style and something that gets a little ironed out, I think, in the kind of utopian, perfect, everything uniform ideal of the Steinway that we've become used to in this music. It's, it's something to look forward to for tonight, the extraordinary sound that we'll hear. And uh, I think we have to stop here, but thank you so much, Christian. We appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.